like my computer never acts as slow. It would do this. It, it's because you're in Zoom, Zoom, Sharon, but I really am glad that you're doing it from your end because everything looks different from my end. So this gives other people who aren't there sure right the opportunity to see it. Like this one, you guys? Go. Yes, that's it right here. Okay. Oh, this one here. It, right there. There you go. Okay. That's the correct case study right there, guys. That's it. Okay. So I wonder if I got the wrong one. Um, well, then the other one that they sent you was just additional information. Okay. So this, the one, the additional information goes, because it's renal failure too. The Correct. The additional information is supplemental to this. So you're going to okay. use the combination of these two things in order to make your care plan. Okay. Because otherwise your care plan is going to be missing information. Right. And I was thinking when I printed this, I'm like, okay. All right. So then we have, then I have everything. We have everything we just showed and we have everything, right? Correct. If you have okay. the case study and you have that additional link, that's what you need to actually answer the questions in the module. Okay. Awesome. Everybody understand that? Yes. Everybody know where to find it now. Thank you for sharing your screen because it's a lot easier when I look at it from your side. Um, you see something different usually than me. And this way, you know, the actual students in the class can see where they need to go. Can you email that additional information that... Uh... So you want me to email the case study and the additional thing? No problem. I'm trying to... Let me see. I'm trying to stop sharing you guys. Sorry. All right, let me just <laughs> okay. pull up the other. Here, I get you to stop sharing. Okay. You just you could just send it to everyone just to be on the safe side. No problem. Okay, so then when you get it, okay, then you're gonna click into here. This isn't the right one. That's the blank one. All right, everybody can see my screen? Yes. Okay, so for this patient, I had two things. I had a case study like you, and then I had a supplemental piece of paper. So I had to go through each one. So I started with the patient's initials, which go up here, okay? And if you just click in here, all right, it's, you can, it'll let you put the information in there. And then my code status. So unless it says otherwise, your code status is gonna be full. If it's not full, it'll say the patient is DNR, DNI, or DNH, just like it does at the hospital. You know, when you go on the chart, there's a little piece of paper there, and it tells you your code status. And then um, your vital signs. Um, PMH is past medical history. So for that, my patient has con congestive heart failure. They have uh, dyspnea on exertion and rest, actually. They have a previous MI. Um, with a cabbage uh, times four. So they had four bypasses. And uh, they also have hyperlipidemia, gout, and osteoarthritis. Okay, so even with all those diagnoses, we think about what was the main thing that brought the patient to the hospital or to see me today. Because when you're doing your care plan, you know, you're focusing in on what is their actual problem right now. That's what you're dealing with. Um, then their uh, social history, which we put in there, um, any pain, okay, and that should be documented in one of those forms somewhere. Now, if it asks you about something and there's no documentation for it, then you're going to put not applicable because you don't have the information. But if it's there, and make sure it's not there if you're going to put that, right? Because we know whether it's there or not. We're not second guessing. I'll be able to tell as soon as I look at the care plan if the information's there or not. Um, admission date, for me, it's gonna be whatever day you do your care plan, I don't care. It doesn't matter what the admission date is, all right? But just correlate your um, goals to that admission date for me, all right? Um, allergies, make sure you get all your allergies, your medications should go first, and then you definitely wanna put any food allergies also, why? Because if my patient is getting a flu shot or if they're getting something that might correlate with what's going on with them in the hospital, I might need to know. Also, dietarily wise, 
I need to know about any food allergies. If they're admitted. You want to make sure you put that in. Um, oxygenation. So for my patient right now, they're on two liters via nasal cannula. Okay. Um, when I listened to the lungs, they had bivacillar bi rels and some other issues. So put in here what you can. As you start to type, it'll let you put it in. It'll just start making the words smaller. That's what it'll do. All right, but whatever you put in there, I'll be able to see it. All right. Um, for cardiac, his point of maximal impulse was displaced. All right. So I really should have put um, heard at um, right for intercostal space. Playing something in the background. Can you mute, please? All right, and as you type it in, it's going to, you know, it'll make the words smaller. It should let you type it in there. If you have a problem with typing something in there, then let me know. But as you can see, it does start to let me in type it in there. All right, skin status. I want to know what it was. If it's there on the paper, I expect it to be documented on here. Um, same thing, if there's any wounds, any grains, any uh, dressing, if there is a wound with the dressing, when was the last time it was changed? So for this, you may not necessarily have a wound, but maybe you have something going on with the um, uh, shunt, okay, with the dialysis shunt. So, you know, whatever it is, that's what you want to document. Also diet, if they're on a renal diet, cardiac diet, are there any limitations with the diet? My mouse is acting funky. Come on, mouse. I think it's acting funky because I was working on the paper. Come on. Okay, so my patient had a pick line. I put that in. I put about, now here, um, I forgot to put the rate and everything in, So, but if there was information that went there, you would want to put it in. If they have an IV line, yours might not. Can't with the computer. It's being funky today. Okay, I'm not touching it. It's just doing what it wants. Make sure you hit all the systems. Professor, hi, Professor Loesch. It's Suzanne. Hi. Hi. So this form, so the form that you're doing right now, we're supposed to do that from the renal? Yes. Uh, paper. Okay. Okay, great. So make sure that you have both the case study and the additional information, which I'm actually going to email to everybody. Okay. All right, so now um, the top was really about the history about the patients. It's going to move on me. It's going to do something stupid, so I apologize. I just don't want to be cooperative here. I'm just going to stop for a second and see if I can get it to go where I want it to without being in zoom okay so the top was just the uh, medical history which we talked about and then when you get to the middle which is where your ram stuff goes
Okay, so psychosocial goes up here first. So you're thinking about what would your patient's body image stage be like? What would their religion be? What would Erickson's stage be? So for this person, I didn't put the body image, but I did put the Erickson stage, which for her would be either integrity versus despair, despair or um, generativity versus industry, depending on the age. And her religion is Christian. What's her role function? Well, she was in her maternal role, which means what? She's the main caretaker of the family, right? She's used to taking care of everybody. Depending on what, um, what role, as far as what her culture is, how that role transitions. Are any of you familiar with Vanessa Giddon? No. Okay, so Vanessa was a soldier at Fort Hood, a military base, and um, she was sexually harassed by other soldiers there, and she reported sexual harassment to her commanding officers, and the sexual harassment cases were never taken seriously. Oh, yeah. Um, in the interim of her reporting, um, the person that sexually harassed her actually um, him and her girlfriend, I, I think he bludgeoned her to death. And then him and the girlfriend actually ended up hiding the body um, in the woods somewhere. And so the family was Hispanic. And um, the case eventually gained international uh, exposure. At first, the military just tried to really sweep the whole thing under the rug. And this is recent, by the way. Mm -hmm. um, they try to sweep the whole thing under the rug, but then, you know, the family just kept pushing and pushing and pushing. And so it finally got- That's the 20-something year old that just passed, right? Yeah, yeah. Until they yeah, finally Yeah, the 21-year-old girl. Yes, until they finally got this national attention or this international attention. Now, up until this day, um, they still haven't told the mother of the family because she has this heavy maternal role, this heavy role of caring for the family. like. This is her. If she had to lose that function as the mother, the family's afraid it could possibly kill her. Mm -hmm. So they won't tell the mother what's happened to the child. Mm -hmm. They just said, you know, that we found her body. She's back with us now. She's in peace. We, we can now make closure with this. At some point for the mother to fully make closure, they're going to have to tell her. But they don't want to because they know how culturally this is going to impact her so you know how does that affect me when i'm the mom and i'm doing everything or if i'm the father let's say and i'm the one paying all the bills right in the house and now i'm in the state where i can't work and i now have to depend on everybody else so that's why we talk about role transitions and also what about me as the child now i'm the child and so now my mom is sick so my role is going to change also because now I'm going to have to be a caregiver and that's going to put a lot of stress and strain on the relationship. Um, for those of you that are women, you understand that dynamic. Some guys may not, but you may understand it in the role with your father. Um, at women as, you know, we come to a point where in our lives where we don't really get along good with our moms. And part of that is because both of us are now moms and wives, and we both kind of have this control feature over our families, right? So when we go in the kitchen to cook together and do other things together, sometimes we have disagreements because mom wants to do it her way, and you have your way, and your way may even consist of some ways that your mother-in-law has included in the dynamics that she wants you to approach a certain way for her son. So there could be a lot of, you know, disagreements there, a lot of agreement, um, a lot of stress there, depending on how that role functions out. And then interdependence talks about the, the support system, like what kind of support do we actually have? Is it going to be our sister, our children? Um, maybe we have support from our job. So what kind of supports uh, overall do we have in life that are going to help us get through um, this stage because things are changing for us? And so when we go from an independent role into more of a dependent role, it could be really uh, detrimental for a lot of people. A lot of people can't cope. And so they have to learn how to re, 
um, invent themselves as a person really to cope in this dynamic. All right, so, um, and then we talk about focal. So when you talk about Roy, um, Roy talks about these three concepts, focal, conceptual, and residual. Focal is our immediate problem. If I fell and I busted my head open, my immediate problem would be that busted head and my neurological status. And that's really what would bring me to the ER is that I need this closure on my head and maybe I'm not feeling so hot. So I might want to get a CT scan or something to make sure something's not going bad. If I'm in congestive heart failure or renal failure, I didn't just get there yesterday. Okay, most of the time. I mean, there are some times when people can go into acute renal failure because of a medication or because of something else that's going on. But typically, this is um, a building process. Okay, so it wasn't that renal failure or that heart failure really that brought me to the hospital. It was something associated with that. So maybe the fact that I'm retaining fluid and I can't breathe very well or I'm retaining waste products. And so neurologically, my brain's a little funky. I can't really think well, I can't focus, um, I might be confused. So um, what other things are happening in the body? Those are the things that really bring me into the ER, right? Nobody walks into the ER and they go, what's wrong with you today? And you go, oh, I have congestive heart failure, right? That's not what you're gonna say. That's not what your patient's gonna say. Um, and then what conceptual is what contributed to that factor? So what's contributing to that shortness of breath? Well, the congestive heart failure is definitely contributing to it because the heart is not pumping as effectively as it should be. Um, the history of the MI could be affecting it because maybe I'm having some rhythmic or some rate problems. Um, and I still could have some circulation problems as well. If I had an MI, that means I had an inclusion at some point. And I already had at least four bypasses because when someone has an MI, this is what happens. When you have an MI, the blood flowing to the heart, okay, um, doesn't go all the way through. Some part of that tissue dies. So some part of that heart is not getting perfused. So we don't open that section back up because once it's necrotic, it becomes you know dead tissue. Dead tissue is um, dead. Once it's dead, it doesn't come back. So in order for us to perfuse the heart from that point, we put what we call a bypass in there. So we pull a vessel from your leg, right? And we do a jumper. We go around that section of the heart, okay? So that area is gonna go around and perfuse. That means you could have other areas that are not perfusing as well also, especially if they had four of them. Because if those vessels are occluded, then other vessels in the body are also occluded. Um, 30 years smoking history, that can certainly contribute to it. Um, and then non-compliance with the diet. So my patients eat a lot of fast food or a lot of fried uh, high salt foods that can also contribute to not only the fluid retention, but sodium in itself can cause issues within the body. All right. And now um, this is stuff that I know that I'm aware of that contribute. I know if I don't eat a proper diet. I know if I don't take my medications routinely. I know if I continue to smoke. I know if I don't follow my fluid restriction that this is all gonna to contribute to this problem. But what things do I not know? That's my residual. So I may not know that because I'm African-American that my hypertension and these other things that I've had for years or that my race may precipitate me to certain um, other risk factors. I may not know that because I'm elderly, my heart may not work as good as it used to. Um, my vessels may not be as compliant and as flexible as they used to. My lungs may not be as compliant as they used to, meaning that they don't um, stretch. They don't um, go in and out as much as they used to. They're more stiffened now. So um, they're not as compliant and they don't work as well. Um, I may not know that the fact that my family continues to feed me all this great food that I love is contributing to my poor health because this is part of my culture and this is the kind of food that I want. This is the kind of food that I desire. I don't desire some of those other foods. And my family wants to make me feel comfortable. And so what are some ways that we can make people feel comfortable? So 
you guys know from dealing with parents and grandparents, sometimes when they're in the hospital, the hospital says, all right, you're going on a cardiac diet. And what's mom, pop, or grandpa say? Hey, I'm hungry. They're not feeding me in here. Or the food they're giving me in here has no taste. I don't like it. Can you just sneak me in some of mommy's <laughs> rice and beans? Can you just sneak me in some chicken? Just a little bit of Burger King. Just a cheesesteak. It won't hurt me. And then, so what does the patient do? They feel guilty. And they bring, I mean, the family, they feel guilty. They want to help mom, dad, or whoever it is. And so they bring the stuff in to try to help them feel better. But meanwhile, they're really hurting the patient. Um, and then um, maybe the patient doesn't want to give up that maternal role or that parental role. They don't want to become dependent on other people. So that could also interfere with their ability to function and to comply with that plan of care. And if your patient's not compliant in the plan of care, it's basically useless. All right, so then down here, you want all these filled out. Whatever the medications they're on, the dose, the frequency and the route. And then what are nursing considerations that we need to um, think about? So I would really go into my drug guide. My favorite drug guide is Davis. Um, I like Davis because if you ever wanna talk about implementations and patient teaching, they're the people. They, they have it right there. Everything you ever needed to know is right there in your patient teaching, um, a lot of it. So you can learn some really valuable information from that. Another good resource for you, this is more of a resource for the floor, is Hippocrates. And it's a free drug guide. You can download it on any um, computer or phone. Now, I like Hippocrates for the clinical component because when I'm on the floor doing nursing care and I need to know if two drugs interact, or two IVs are not compatible, I can pop it right into Hippocrates and it will tell me. Also, if I walk in behind the nurse that was working before me and I find a drug on the floor, I can pick it up, I can dial into Hippocrates, almost every drug out there, the uh, markings on the drug and it will tell me what the drug is. So that's why I like it and it's free. Um, and they have a little bit of It's called Hippocrates. It's E-P-O-C-R-A-T-E-S. Thank you. You're welcome. Lab and diagnostic tests, okay? A lot of students don't put this stuff in and it's important. All right, I need to know what the lab values are. The sodium here is elevated on the patient. So what's that gonna tell me about the patient? Well, maybe I'm looking at the patient and neurologically they're acting funky because I know that sodium, one of the main things it's going to affect is my patient's neurological status. So I would wanna know that the sodium level is off. How about the potassium level? What's that gonna affect? Cardiac, right? So I gotta think about if my potassium levels are off, my patient could introduce a cardiac arrhythmia. Something else could happen. What else happens when potassium's off? Muscle weakness, progressive muscle weakness, usually starts at the legs and works its way up. So it could be causing some other issues in my patient. How about their BUN and their creatinine? What's that gonna tell me? Kidney function. Kidney. So I'm gonna wanna know that for my renal patient, right? Um, AST is going to be liver function. So I might want to take a look at my liver function. I always want to take a look at my electrolytes because electrolyte imbalances, one electrolyte imbalance can cause another and that can cause overall problems. What would I expect my potassium levels to be in a patient that has kidney failure? Would I expect them to be low, high, or normal? With kidney failure? It's high, right? High. Why? Still thinking here. <laughs> okay. Who else? Can you state the question again, Ms. Susan? Can you restate it again? Yes. 
So the first question I asked is, how would I expect my potassium to be, high, low, or normal? And the student answered high, and that's correct. Now, why would I expect mm -hmm. my potassium level to be high in a patient with renal failure? Because the patient retaining fuel. Okay, because the kidneys excrete potassium. So I'm going to expect my patient to be hyperkalemic, too much potassium. Yeah. Hyperkalemic, too much potassium. What am I at risk for? Yeah, the heart, the heart. Cardiac arrhythmias. Cardiac arrhythmias I'm at risk for. Now, if my potassium is too high, okay, too high, it's going to make changes on that EKG. Changes like an elevated um, T wave, a peak T wave, a high peak T wave. <laughs> it also could affect my QRS wave. When those waves are affected or adjusted, it causes changes within the cardiac conduction system. All right. Um, the echocardiogram, that's going to show anything about a change in my heart. So for this patient, because this patient is heart failure, I would want to know what my ejection fraction is. Because the ejection fraction represents what? Anybody? The pumping of the heart, right? Yes, the, the like, heart's the ability pumping. to pump. And when I'm in congestive heart failure, what's the problem here? Can't pump. You can't expand. You can't pump. Can't pump right. and expand. You're not pumping well. Okay, so that injection fraction makes a big deal because. Now, for this patient um, and for my renal patient, I would want to look at my ABGs, right? Because what do the kidneys do? What's part of the kidneys' job? To excrete the, the toxins and everything out. Okay, that's one thing. They're going to excrete the toxins and the waste out of the body. What else? Um, that regulates... What is the EVGs. That's the, it filters out the kidney. Is the, is the filter. It's like the filter system. Okay, it does filter the waste products out of the body. What else do the kidneys do? Homeostasis. Okay, homeostasis. They regulate the body. They're a compensatory measure. So let's say I'm in respiratory alkalosis, okay, because I'm hyperventilating. My kidneys aren't going to work right away because they're a slower method of working than the lungs, right? But they are going to compensatorily um, try to bring me back into a normal state over time by doing different things through in the body. Also, they selectively absorb and excrete different electrolytes and stuff from out of the body. So if it says I have, if the body tells me I have too much salt, the kidneys will say, okay, we'll get rid of the salt and retain a little more water. If I have too much um, magnesium, okay, we'll get rid of some of the magnesium and retain something else. So they're really controlling mm -hmm. the function of the body and how the body is processing different things throughout it. So I would want to know what my ABGs are, you know, if it was available to me. I would want to list this here, okay? What about drug levels? Why would I might want to put drug levels in here? If the person's like an alcoholic, it'll be elevated, or the kidneys wouldn't function as correctly because of damage probably to the kidneys. Okay, well, I'm not really talking about alcohol levels here. I mean, if I was concerned that my patient was an alcoholic, I might be. But what do I okay. know about drugs in general? Okay, so myosins. Let's talk about myosins for a second, like vancomycin, urethromycin, okay? Myosins never let you win. They affect your kidneys and your hearing, meaning that I can become necrotoxic or autotoxic from taking these drugs. So if I was on a hot, if, let's say I was on vancomycin for so 
some reason. And why would my patient be on vancomycin? Well, they're in the hospital, right? I got this sloppy nurse working at the bedside. And in the middle of her sloppiness, okay, because this is a true story. Yes, it is. She went from one patient's room with C. diff to another oh, patient's room and attention. didn't change her gloves. So the patient got C. diff, and now I can't get rid of the C. diff. I've tried everything, so now my patient's going on vancomycin. Now, because I know myosins are toxic, and I just said they're toxic because they affect, myosins never let you win. They affect your kidneys and your hearing, meaning they make you nephrotoxic and autotoxic if they're not monitored. So one of the things we're going to do when this patient's on vanco is we're going to do what we call peaks and troughs. So we're gonna measure how much drug is in the system so they don't become nephrotoxic and they don't become autotoxic. So if I were giving my patient this Vanco and I wasn't monitoring kidney function, could I cause an acute kidney injury? Yeah. Yes. yes, and that could put my patient into renal failure. So this is why I wanna know what are my drug levels. Now, when we talk about drug levels, typically we talk about drugs that have the potential for toxicity. And you'll know these types of drugs because NCLEX loves to test you on drug levels that have toxicity levels, like digoxin, like theophylline. Um, you know, those are just some examples, but there's plenty of drugs out there. You know, Vanco, you're always going to be monitoring. Any myosin, if you're giving it IV, you're going to be monitoring it. Uh, what else? Um, any blood cultures, any x-rays, um, any CT scans, any MRIs that might show any abnormalities? How about a UA? Am I going to get a UA on my patient in renal failure? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Sometimes I can. Sometimes, you know, I have to get it other ways because a lot of times these pa patients don't produce urine, but right, some right. do. Right. <laughs> so now for the next one, it's teaching and discharge needs related to the behaviors and stimuli. So let's say I'm teaching my renal patient about their diet. All right. I know for a cardiac diet, I'm going to limit sodium intake. I might have to restrict fluids. Um, I might want them to follow like a DASH diet. Okay. How about for renal failure? What kind of diet would I expect my patient to follow? No sodium. <laughs> no, yeah. And here's a lot of problem with the renal patients, okay? They get really sick of eating the same diet over and over. I can't have this. I can't have that. So how are you going to teach them how to cheat? Because we have to be able to cheat, okay? If you don't cheat, your diet's going to fail, right? Agree or disagree? Agree. 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 Okay. So how are we going to teach them how to cheat and still maintain that diet? Write it down. Okay, maybe. How about eating that cheat meal after your dialysis? Oh. Because right now your body can tolerate it a little bit, right? Yeah. So we give them that little bit of cheat. So when I used to take my patient to dialysis all the time, when we would come back, we would stop at Burger King and we would get that burger and fries. He could have it for the day and then right back to the renal diet. Um, other ways you can get them how to cheat is, let's say they like coffee or a particular drink. So as opposed to, um, and this isn't really a cheat, but it's more of, I know they have to be on this fluid restriction. So rather than not give them any of it, give them like an ounce here, an ounce there, an ounce here. And they really enjoy being able to have that little bit of it. And you stretching it out across the day because it's better than just totally taking it away. Because if you tell me I can't have something, I'm going to want it that much more. And this is why diabetics have such a hard time controlling their diet because everybody else in the house is still eating what? Sugar. Cakes and pies. And but it's not even the cakes and pies that kills the diabetic, right? It's the regular everyday breads and carbs that kills them. Carbs with the breads, yep. Yeah. So, you know, if I want my patient's diabetes to be in control at home, the best way is to have everybody in the house eating that diabetic <laughs> diet. Because then, you know, it's easier for me to eat 
what everybody else has on their plate. You got this little squammy diabetic diet on my plate while you're sitting over there, you know, eating fried chicken and watermelon and mashed potatoes and gravy. No, I'm not going for that okie doke. So, you know, it's, and then other parts of your teaching would be things like if your patient was on a cardiac diet or they were on a renal diet and you're having problems controlling that diet, you might want to refer them to a nutritionist because they might be able to bring another component into it to help the patient understand ways that they can actually conform to this diet, still have their little cheat days and still have better outcomes for them. Um, some patients just aren't going to be compliant with this, and but you're still going to do everything that you can to try to get them there, but you have to pick your battles as a nurse, okay, and you don't want to get into a battle with the patient. Ultimately, it's their decision whether or not they want to fo follow what's been uh, prescribed to them, okay, and then other things that you would teach them is, you know, what are signs and symptoms of the disease process that I should report or that I should seek immediate treatment for. Um, make sure they keep up with their follow-up appointments um, when they leave the hospital or when they leave wherever they're at, the rehab or wherever they're going. And that's all going to be related to your stimuli. Now, here at the bottom, the stuff that you put in there at the top in the stimuli context is the same. So my patient came in for shortness of breath. That was my focal. My contextual stimuli was that my patient had congestive heart failure, a history of an MI with that cabbage times four, the three year smoking history, and non compliance with the diet. And then their residual stimuli was, you know, that they were African American, um, elderly, the culture believes in specific dietary <laughs> customs. So it was really just cutting and pasting from what you put up there in those boxes to right here. Now, subjective. Um, information okay so what is subjective is what the patient tells you what you can't physically maybe see all right so like what the patient's telling me is that they were short of breath they have weakness tiredness dizziness those are things i can't see they have orthopnea they're telling me about this i'm not there so i don't see that they're sleeping on three pillows at night what yeah, are yeah. the things that i can see now that will tell me those same things so if I wanted to say dizziness, what kind of thing could I say that might reflect that? Vertigo. Um, steady on their feet, right? Mm -hmm. Steady on their feet, yeah. Um, how about a low blood pressure? A blood pressure of like 80 over 50 or 90 over 60 even. Yeah. Hypotensive. Um, hypotensive. Okay, so, but you can't just say hypotensive there for objective, you have to show it with the vital signs. Oh. Now, like the positive JVD, okay, I put that on there, but there's actually a way you can measure that, and I would put that, that the JVD measured above a 30-degree angle or a 45-degree angle or whatever it was. My pulse ox was 89% of room air. That's how I can see shortness of breath. My respirations were 28, and maybe I had some sort of sternal or um, rib retraction or nasal flaring. That would show me shortness of breath. Um, and complete a, a sentence. The um, tachycardia, okay, that shows me that I have decreased cardiac output. The um, pitting edema, that's showing that uh, I could have shortness of breath or I could have some other issues because if I know I have extra fluid on board, that's going to affect my ability to breathe, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, so then um, nursing diagnoses. So I put three on here. Let me separate them out. All right, for me, for this patient, the shortness of breath is what brought him, brought him to the hospital. For me, that's the priority nursing diagnosis because right now they can't breathe and I need to get that breathing under control a little bit. So I've catered my five nursing interventions to that. Okay, even though I have three nursing diagnoses, it says list your three in priority order, all right? 
Well, check the one you address. You address. So for me, it's this one I'm addressing. All right, and then if you can, you put yourself on mute, please. Um, I'm looking at the intervention. So my intervention should be catered towards that. So what kind of things would help my patient develop more effective breathing? So one, I might have to put them on oxygen. And I want my SATs really to be 92% or better. This isn't a COPD patient, okay? And 92% is where I can send them home from the hospital. Now I wrote between 92% and 100, because for me, there has to be a range there. You can't say, oh, my patient's pulse ox is gonna be 94%. You don't know that. It's going to be all over the place. It might be 94% now, and when they start walking up the steps, it might drop to 89%. So don't put realistic, unrealistic <laughs> interventions or goals there. All right, so Lasix. Um, we're giving the patient Lasix. Now, you don't, I just put a specific order in there. Um, you could put just Lasix in there as long as you're, you know, saying per MD order. And what's that Lasix going to do for the patient? It it might, go ahead. It removes water weight. It'll help get rid of some of that fluid so maybe I can breathe a little bit easier, right? So it is going to help my breathing if I get rid of some of the fluid, right? And that's what the Lasix will do. Why would I want to do daily weights? To make sure they're not retaining a fluid? Yes. So mm -hmm. I'm doing daily weights. I'm giving Lasix. Maybe I'm doing daily weights to see is the Lasix actually effective? Is the fluid going off? Um, how about fluid restriction? Why would we want them on a fluid restriction? So you don't get fluid overload? You get fluid. <laughs> All right, they're probably already in fluid overload, right? We want to try to reduce that. Now, yes. do I have to be careful here? Yes, because I'm giving my patient a diuretic and I'm restricting fluids. All right, I can give it to this patient because they're not in renal failure. If my patient's in renal failure, would I be able to give them a diuretic? No. Maybe, but maybe not a loop diuretic. I may have to consider what I'm gonna give them and how serious the renal failure is. Um, but most of the time when we're trying to get fluids off our patient renal failure, what are we doing with them? Dialysis. Right. Dialysis. All right, and then eyes and O's I'm monitoring. Would I monitor I and O's on my renal patient? Yes. Yes. Yeah, make sure. Okay. They're outputting so everything they take in. And then I'm going to give my patient education and put them on a cardiac two gram sodium diet, right? And try to, again, prevent them from retaining more fluid, which is ultimately affecting the breathing capacity. Also, I could teach them how to do purse-lip breathing because that can help them control that shortness of breath. Some other things I might do, I might teach them about, you know, conserving energy by when they get up in the morning time and they have the most energy, do the hard things that they need to do then so that when they're tired the in the afternoon, they can take it easy. And this way they're um, going back and forth between rest and using that energy back and forth so that they don't tire themselves out completely. Now goals, okay? You have to have um, two short-term and one long-term goal, okay? So for this patient, um, I made the short-term goals. One is to be able to demonstrate the breathing techniques to use during those episodes of shortness of breath. And he'll do this within 12 hours of being hospitalized because when he came into the hospital, he was short of breath, the pulse ox was down at 
their respirations were increased to 28. So we want to try to get that under control right away, right? And get our O2 sacks up and get our perfusion and our cardiac output and stuff back. So if we can teach the patient how to do a little bit of controlled breathing, we can start to get a little bit of control on the shortness of breath. At the same time, we're gonna introduce the patient to a couple of liters of oxygen on a nasal cannula. And if we're able to, we wanna bring that O2 sat above 92%. Now, when you look at the evaluation part, you're supposed to have two goals that were met and one goal that wasn't met. So for this patient, he didn't meet that goal of getting two liters of oxygen and maintaining the O2 sat above 92%. So that goal wasn't met. So we had to actually increase his O2 um, consumption to four liters per minute. And by doing that, we were able to bring it above 92%. So we'll continue to work on this goal of getting it down, of titrating that oxygen to the point where it's just not on oxygen anymore. If you can. And then, um, again, the same thing with the fluid, okay? But I made this one for 7 20, 20. Our patient was admitted six something, okay? So it's going to take time to get your patient to be in compliance with a fluid restriction and a dietary restriction. I mean, we could do it right away in the hospital, but to get them to comply with that at home, it's not going to happen overnight because it's a bad habit that they develop. And when people develop bad habits, it can sometimes take years to break those habits. And the patient has to be willing and ready and not in denial because a lot of times they're in denial and they'll just keep saying to themselves, this isn't my fault. It's nothing I'm doing that's causing this. And they're not willing to make those changes. All right, questions. I guess I explained it really good. Huh? Nobody has any questions? You might be on mute. Okay, then we're good with the care plan, right? Did I lose you guys? Are you alive out there? We'll <laughs> ask questions after. When is it due by Professor Loge? I believe it's due 10 4 at midnight. 10 4 at midnight. Oh. On you guys' calendar. Yeah, thank you. But I believe it's 10 4 at midnight. Now, I'm asking for anyone who wants revisions, and let me just pull something up for you. Okay. So, this is what I use to evaluate it. So, you get points for each section. But if you send it in, like let's say you send your interventions in without rationales, because for those interventions, you have to have five interventions, five rationales, and references. And it either has to be like a link there that I could click on to go to the reference, or it has to be the author, the book, and the page number. Okay. So five interventions and five rationales. Yes, and then the references. If and that references. doesn't consist for me, I will not accept the care plan as passing. Okay, and how many references do we need? Just one reference for each intervention. Okay, one for so, so if you're if you doing get this all for your the interventions human, out of the same book, uh -huh. then you only need the one reference. Okay. Just say, this is for all the interventions. Ms. Susan, do you believe the morning um, teachers that Ms. D is doing this also, like a grading system? So I should follow this? It I'm should dead. be the same grading system, but um, just check with her and ask her if she has the rubric for you, but it should be the same. You guys have Mr. Corsi, right? Yes. Okay. So it's just broken down and, you know, I mean, spelling and grammatical errors are worth five points. So you can lose a five point deduction on the care plan. Mm -hmm. just that. Now, as long as you get, I believe on these, you have to have 75 or higher.
But again, I don't care if you get a hundred on it, which you won't anyway, but if you don't have the <laughs> rationales, the references for me, you will not get a hundred on it, even if you have a hundred, because I won't pass it without that. Okay. So it says three to five interventions with rationales. We need rationales. We need five interventions, not three or up to three. Where was the one I just had up here? Let me get that back up. I thought you guys had to have five interventions. and rationales, but you're only doing it for the one priority nursing diagnosis. You have to have three nursing diagnoses. Oh, okay. Okay, but then for one, whichever one you consider your priority nursing diagnosis, which I consider whichever one you guys put first. Okay. And you need the five rationales behind that one? Yes, the five interventions and rationales for that one nursing diagnosis. So your rationales and interventions, your goals should all go towards that one nursing diagnosis, not towards all three. Okay. And it should be married together. You see, this is married together because if I do this, it's going to help this. And some of these <laughs> interventions may help some of those other nursing diagnoses as well but everything should be correlated towards your priority nursing diagnosis. Now I'm asking for anybody, and you can submit before. Anybody who wants revisions for my class, I want your care plans by the end of week five. Okay. By that Friday of week five. So this way I send you back. And if you put the revisions in that I tell you, there's no reason why you shouldn't get a hundred on this. And I think for the day class, if you follow that structure, you should be fine as well. Anybody else with questions on the care plan? Okay, how about math? Anybody need math today? You might be on mute, so I'm giving you a minute to answer. We didn't do the math yet. Hi, Ms. Most. This is Alicia. I do have a question about the math. Okay. Um, the math that we had on our last uh the quiz for the week that just passed mm -hmm. um i had a few questions because like if on there if it did not ask you to round anything are we not rounding it or we just automatically should be rounding so you should be following those rounding rules that are on the page of your module where it says rounding rules mm-hmm that's what you should be following unless this question specifically tells you to round one certain portion of it. Okay. Okay. All right. I did, I guess we would have to wait to the quiz to be uh, done. Um, Cause I did it one time, but I had to go back on there and do it again. Um, but I had a question of like the last two. So I, I don't know that we be able to ask that now, but so it, it, everybody might have not submitted it or Hold should on I okay let me get out of the student view
Don't forget, guys, to sign into the chat box for me, please. Fine, one more. I'm going to go over these examples with you guys, um, but I won't give you the actual questions, so you won't get the actual answers, but you'll learn how to actually do the uh, calculation. Okay. Okay, the last one, this one here is. Okay, so you guys can see my screen? Yes. Yes. Okay, let's look at the first one. Anybody know how to do this first one? So we have medication set at a rate of 60 mLs per hour at 815 with a volume of 200 mLs. And we need to calculate both the infusion time and the completion time and then round it to the nearest tenth. So the first thing that you have to figure out is we have 200 mLs, right? It's going at 60 mLs an hour. So how long will it take to round that and we're looking for mLs per hour. So how long is it going to take for that medication to be infused? Okay. 
So how would you do that calculation? Come on, don't be shy. I know I got some smarty pants in this class. You divide, you divide uh, 60 by 200, which is three points um, something. And um, that's three hours, 15 seconds. Okay, you divide 60 you by it. 200. So if we divide 60 by 200, which actually it's 200 by 60, right? Yeah, 200 by by 60. That gives us 3.33 hours. So we're going to round that to 3.3 hours. Okay. Yeah. So we know it's going to take us 3.3 hours for this medication to infuse. Now we started at 815. So if we go up three hours, that's 1115, right? Yes. But now we have to figure out what that 0.3 hours represents. Multiply by six. So we're going to take that 0.3 and multiply it by 60. And what happened when you did that? I got to do that. 0.3 divided by 60? Times 60. Time 60. Point 18 minutes. Okay, so now that gives you 18 minutes, which you're going to add on to that 1115. So 1115 and 18 minutes equals what? 43. 11.33. So that's what time our infusion is going to stop at 11.33 p.m and it's gonna take 3.3 .3 hours to infuse. So that's the two questions that it asked us, right? What time would it be complete and how long would it take us to complete? Anybody not get that? So where did the, the uh, point three come from? Okay. Or so, is it 3.3? So, yeah, it was 3.3 .3 hours. So, oh, okay. we, we took 200 and we divided mm -hmm. it by 60. Go ahead and do that for mm -hmm. me. Yes, and that's when I got the 3.333, which okay. we changed it to 3.3 so hours. So, in order to get hours, uh, so you know it's three hours, but what does your point three represent as far as minutes? Because you can't just use three hours, right? Because it was oh, three, that's like, the three point hours. three. Okay, that's where I so wasn't sure where the actual point three came from. You take that point three because you had three point three three three. Now, if it was three point three five, you would round up to three point four. Okay, and then you would take okay. that point four times sixty to get your minutes. Oh, okay, okay. We took that point three times 60, that gives us 18 minutes. So that tells us it took three hours and 18 minutes. So we just need to add the three hours and 18 minutes to the 815, and that will tell us okay. what time the infusion actually stopped. Okay. All right, I got it. I just wasn't sure where they actually came. Okay, so I got it now. <laughs> Okay, so for the next one, we have warfarin, sodium, six milligrams IV push daily over one minute. The dose available is warfarin, sodium, two milligrams per ml, and we need to calculate how much to give in 15 seconds. So we have to, we have to divide six by two to get a ml. And that will be three ml. So for every 15 seconds, we have to divide by four. So it's like 0 0.75. 0 0.75. You said we have to divide by what? Four. Four. You divide three by four because F and 15 seconds, we have four, four in 15. 
I will say we have a uh, 15 seconds times four make one mini. And we're looking for one mini, so you have to divide the three by by four to get this 15 seconds. I don't know how we explain that. Okay. Yeah, that's correct, Michael. <laughs> Okay, so for this one, Michael's correct. You take six milligrams because that's your desired dose, right? Yeah. And you divide it by two milligrams because that's what you have on hand. So everybody do that step. That should give you three milligrams. And then you would multiply that times one. If it was something other than one, then that's what you would multiply it by. Mm -hmm. Okay, and that tells you how much you're giving over one minute. And then you have to divide that by four because there's four 15 second intervals in a minute. So what'd you get, Michael? 0 0.75. Okay, everybody understand that? Yes. Anybody who does it? Okay, how about the next one? to do it the next one you have to convert and gram to milligram and you divide um more i'm doing They flow rate. Now, are we are we converting the milligrams to grams? Yes. Okay. By multiplying by it's just it's just the direct calculation because flow rate is a the map. I mean. Six divided by three thousand multiplied by five hundred. One. Yeah, I got one too. Okay, so it should be, the way I do it is I take the six and I multiply it times 60. Then I divide that whole thing by 3,000 times the 500. Yeah, because if the flow rate is in R. Oh, wait. Sue, can you repeat how you um you did the problem? Like how you set it up first? I got 10. Um, 
I took six and I multiplied it times 60. Six times 60. Because that tells me how much is in an hour. Okay. And then I divided that whole thing. I took my three grams and converted it to 3,000 milligrams. Three grams. Three thousand. Okay. And then I multiplied that times five hundred. So you're disregarding the six thousand. You, you're yeah. not gonna turn that six into anything. I'm gonna look at something else here. Make sure I told you that. I was thinking. Yeah. To be right, I got six times sixty. My That's three six. How you did yours? Let's see what you got. Six times sixty divided by three thousand because I converted the grams into milligrams. And that gave me zero point one two, and then I multiplied the whole thing times five hundred. And that gave me, wait a minute, something I did wrong there. Let's see. Yeah, that gave me 60. Um, Michael, tell me how you did it. Yes, um, because the flow rate, it should be an hour. So if we multiply six by 60, where they convert everything to hour, and you divide by 3,000 because in, in the gram, you have to convert to milligram to cancel the uh, milligram out and multiply by 500. So you got 60 also? Yeah. Okay, I just wanna make sure we're all on the same page here. Everybody go with that? Flow, so with the flow rate, it's automatically 60? Yeah, no. because the flow rate is no, always the flow rate out. is 60 because you have lidocaine, six milligrams per minute, but our flow rate mm -hmm. is going to be in hours. Because it's ml per hour, the flow rate. Yeah. Wait, I didn't hear you. Uh, can you say that one more? Yeah. So you have lidocaine, six milligrams mm -hmm. per minute. For your flow rate, your flow rate is going to be in mls per hour. Okay. So in order to okay. convert six milligrams per minute to six milligrams to hours, you got to take and multiply six times 60. There's 60 minutes in an hour. So that's what I'm saying. It's always going to automatically be like when they say what's the flow rate, would it automatically be 60? The flow rate should be in mLs per hour, not 60. Get okay. 60 out of your okay. brain. So I'm sorry. Okay. So it'll be... So being so there's no number there, we're just saying. Why 60. we use 60 is because there's 60 minutes in an hour. Yes, yes, okay. Okay. All right, I get it. All right. Anybody else? Hi, Miss Loge. Hi, everybody. Hi. Hi. All right, just getting off from work. <laughs> okay, so we're good with these ones? Yes. Yes. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, I feel better. <laughs> okay, you guys want to try to go through some of the questions from the chapters? Yeah. How'd everybody feel about their exam? Ooh, I don't feel good. <laughs> trying to stay positive, trying to stay hopeful. Yes. Yeah. The first time around, so you have to stay hopeful. There's no choice there. <laughs> Question: I know I'm, I'm. I apologize. I know you guys are done with the math, and um, darn, I forgot my question. Oh well, I'll just talk after class. Okay, I'll hang around if you want to go back over the math. I don't. Yeah, I don't want you to have to do it all over again. I just had like maybe like. One yeah, me too. Me too, Miss Sue. I'm at work. Don't want me to have to do it all over again. Then why am I tutoring? All right. <laughs> Miss Sue, are you going to send this over again and again and again and again? And guess what? <laughs> You're worth it. It doesn't bother me. Thank you. I know. That's why I appreciate you. Yeah, my God. Miss Sue, are you going to send this recording like you did last week? 
Yes, I am recording this. I don't awesome. know how great the recording was last week. I it hate was myself on recording, just mm -hmm. so you know. It was great. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's see if I can get this book up now. I'm going to just stop sharing for one second because it seems to be easier for me to get the book up when I'm not sharing. Oh, well, I keep going there. I need to go into the point, the point, the point, not oh, severity. So how many of y'all got to read the chapters and go through the stuff? We wish we could. <laughs> That's our also, intention, but that doesn't mean we get to it. <laughs> okay. Um, Dominique, would you mind bringing up your point for me, please, again, in under um, student view, so I could just show them what I showed you about the concepts and all. Are you still on? All right, if anybody has the point up or could easily bring it up and do a screen share, if you could do it for me, I would I would appreciate it. So I can show you guys. I'm still on this, too. Okay. I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm pulling it up now. Sorry. All right. All right, I'm just dropping everything down. Give me a second, you guys. I was still working on that. <laughs> so even after you guys level up to an eight, just so you know, if you're not getting a concept or you still don't feel like you're getting it, you could still do questions in there. You can stay in practice mode and it'll keep, keep ringing you um, questions, but I'm going to show you how to get to some other questions or some other things that might be beneficial for you to use when you're in there. Okay. Can I read? Yep. Yes. Okay. Yes. Sorry, I just got a lot up right now. Um, so go ahead and go into your practice quiz like you're going to set one up. Yes. Y'all see my strengths, right? It's like, no. <laughs> and then um, where it says chapters, if you guys click on that, you can actually pull up different nursing concepts if you feel like you're just weak in one area or another. But maybe you don't want to go back through the whole chapter. Oh, I see. So it's all types of stuff in there. Can you That's guys see it? Good to know. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I just found out today. She showed me today. I was yeah, like, wow, this is so great. Know. Do it again. Do it again. Go back out. Okay. I missed that one step. All right. So, hold on. I missed it too. I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah. Oh, so, practice quiz. Go quit. into prep you and go into practice quizzes just like you're setting one up. Mm hmm. And then right here, just click it. Yep, click where it says chapters and then hit nursing concepts. Oh. oh, okay. Oh, boy. Now, can you open that screen up a little bit further? That's uh, a great screen. I don't know. Can I, you guys? Oh, I got it. Never mind. It was on my end. Um, can you just go ahead and click on one of those? I just want to see if we have any other options in there that you guys may not be aware of. Okay, I'll do caring interventions. That's okay. That's fine. Okay. I'll just do five. Start quiz. It looks okay. like it, it looks like it's not going to give you any other options. It's just going to let you take the quiz, but that's okay because mm -hmm. at least you're getting stuff out of that. Mm -hmm. but let's go up a little bit before you exit it. Oh, sorry. 
<laughs> so let's see the questions okay. a little bit. How about we do theory since we That's fine. Yeah. But now it's gonna give you by chapter. So you wanna go back oh, right, to concepts. Right, right. Yeah. Right, right. Good catch. So you got two options in there, nursing concept and question the uh chapters. The chapters. Yes. Okay. All right. Start quiz. Okay. So to practice ethically. The nurse should avoid. So, have you seen this question before? I think so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, it might bring you the same questions. It might bring you other ones. I don't know. Yeah, but I saw If you're this just one. working on a certain concept or a certain area, it might be helpful. All right. Okay. Oh. All right. Okay. Yep, that's it. One or three. Yeah. Everybody, good with how to get there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. This, one. this is the one I'm typing on, and I actually come and see what I wrote. I'm not even gonna say it. <laughs> okay, now let me get back into my book. Stupid. Why my computer always thinks I'm a robot? Sorry guys, I hate Zoom just because it is so doggone slow. But it does what it does, so I can't fix that part. Ms. Loesch, can we go back to the last question we did in math when you're through? It still sit on me. Okay. We're, when we're done going through these questions, I'm going to go back to math so that people that want to go over it can go over it. Yeah, because I did it a different way. With oh, the 60? As long as you got the right answer. <laughs> That's no, it came out differently. It came out differently. Okay. 
All right, let me share this screen here. All right, can you guys see? Yes. Okay, so the orderly progression of the steps of the nursing process. Nobody better get this wrong. B. And we don't have pie, add ice cream. Ice cream and pie are just as good. B. Okay, so we always say add pie. For those of you that don't know, add pie. Is there anybody that doesn't know add pie? That's how you remember it. That's your mnemonic. Assessment, diagnosis, planning, implementation, and evaluation. <laughs> Nurse analyzes client data to identify strengths and health problems that independent nursing interventions can prevent or resolve. Which step of the nursing process is the nurse performing? Diagnosis. Anybody else have a choice on that? Good job. Okay, diagnosis. We're looking at that client data. We try to identify those strengths and weaknesses. Uh, make sure that um, we're able to treat what our patient is there for, okay? That's what makes you autonomous. It gives you this independent nursing interventions that you can do um, to resolve things for the patients. As an LPN, you couldn't do that. You couldn't make a nursing diagnosis. You can look at stuff and evaluate it, but there's a fine line between that and assessment of what you can do. So, you know, this is where your process of thinking is now going to change. Because even though someone might even collect some of that data and stuff for you, you're still going to have to val validate that data and make sure it's true if you're relying on someone else's eyes and ears to do that collection process for you. nursing process is based upon the process of problem solving. The nurse attempts to obtain a blood pressure on the client's right arm and then on the left, and then on the left leg, and finally on the right leg, where the blood pressure is obtained. What type of problem solving did the nurse use? Is it D? Is it C? I would go with C. C. Right. Yeah, I think it's C too. I don't know. Okay, tell me why, Michael, you think it's critical thinking, and then I'm going to ask you ladies to tell me why you think it's problem and error. Um, maybe it's problem solving because it's critical thinking. I don't know. Okay, so in critical thinking, we have a disciplined, comprehensive thought basis. It's based on standards, all right? So we have this well-reasoned, systematic way of thinking. And we use this um, investigative procedures, and we use things that we've um, done in the past to try to pull into it, to try to um, get to a particular action or to try to resolve what's going on with the patient, right? But when we're critically thinking, let's say we came in and we found our patient unconscious on the floor. So what are different things that you're doing? You're checking vital signs. Um, you might be listening to them. You might check their blood sugar. Right? You're going through these different things, trying to think what could be wrong with them, right? So when you're doing trial and error, what are you doing? You're going through this different method, testing a different number of solutions until you find one that actually works. Um, when you're doing intuitive thinking, you're um, trying to use your background experience, your knowledge, and your skill to try to solve the problem. And then scientifically, we might identify a problem, 
collect data on it, form a hypothesis, and go through that whole process of testing in order to get to the answer. So now when you think about those definitions, which one do you think this one really kind of fits into? Trial and error? Yeah, I still think it's trial and error. But then I'm thinking, why are we taking blood pressure on all the ligament? Well, I'll tell you why. <laughs> One day I got a call. I was doing IV infusions, okay? And I got a call from a patient that was discharged from the hospital yesterday. Um, I was actually supposed to go see him at 1 o'clock. It was 10 o'clock in the morning. And they were having a headache and just didn't feel very good, okay? So um, I speeded up my time and I went right to the patient's house. The physician told him just to take the Tylenol uh, for the headache. And so um, when I got to the patient's house, I started trying to take the blood pressure. So I took it on the left arm. I couldn't get a pressure. Took it on the right arm. Couldn't get a pressure. Repositioned the patient. I did this, that, and the other thing. Finally, I get a pressure of 80 over 50. I'm concerned. My patient just got discharged yesterday. All right. So I call 911 for the patient. The patient had a bleed. All right. But sometimes if your patient has a bleed or if something else is going on, you might not be able to feel those pulses. You might not be able to get a blood pressure in that one spot. So you might have to move your cuff around to where you can actually get a pressure. So that's why we would be doing it. All right. Okay. In the ideal patient, like if I came and took a blood pressure, and this is why, you know, even in the clinical world, if we were in school right now in the lab component, I would have you guys taking blood pressures on each other. And one of the reasons would be because the majority of you are young, healthy people and getting a blood pressure or a pulse is pretty easy. But what about when you have to do it on that 89 year old patient who has pulmonary hypertension or some other issue going on or you know, this patient that does have a bleed or does have a problem, it's not just simple slap the cuff on the arm and you get a pressure because you don't always. And so then, you know, you may have to use some other methods to figure it out. The nurse is caring for a client in a critical care unit. The cardiac monitor alarms. The nurse recognizes the rhythm as a flutter. What two skills did the nurse use to interpret the cardiac rhythmia? D. Yeah, cognitive and technical. Yeah, I agree. Okay, so cognitive is having the knowledge of what that A flutter actually looks like and being able to count that strip because it's not even just the knowledge, right? You might look at the rhythm and see it's a flutter, but then there's still some things that, that you have to do to recognize. So what are you doing? You're looking at the P wave, you're looking at the QRS, you're looking at all the things that are part of that wave. You know, how did the rhythm come? How often do we see a spike? So you're looking at all these things on the monitor to read it, and then you have to have some technical skills too. All right, so cognitive is that knowledge base, and then technical skills is the actual ability to be able to run the uh, equipment and be able to use the equipment to be able to, to obtain the results that you need to get and obtain them correctly. Nurses measured the tip of the client's nose to his earlobe and then down to the xiphoid price process before inserting the NG tube and attaching it to low suction. Which components of the nursing process has the nurse demonstrated? It doesn't A. Need A. Yeah. Yeah. Where's my phone? Yeah, thank you, well, I might be epic. Oh, I'm picking A is an Alex. Okay, so show me which part equals the evaluation. I go with C. Planning and implementing. 
So yeah. now here's a perfect example, okay? First, what we want to do is determine what the topic of the question is, okay? So the question's asking us about measuring, the nurse measuring this NG tube and the steps that she's using to do it, okay? So did we see implementation in, that, in those steps? Yes, no. I saw it, right? Yes. She implemented a measure here. But did she yes. evaluate? Um, yeah. Did she evaluate? What did she evaluate? No. No, because she just attached it to the little stuff. Okay. Did she diagnose? Uh, no. No. Okay. Did she plan? Yes. 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 Okay. Plans. And you already said she implemented. Okay. Yeah. In this statement, did she assess? No. No. Well, it passed the assessment. A little bit. I mean, she assessed as part of her implementation, right? She looked oh, yeah. to see she if the measurements, what the measurements are. She's assessing mm -hmm. the length of that tube to go in the nose, right? Yeah. Did she diagnose? Yes. Did she diagnose? No. No, because... No, she didn't diagnose. No, she didn't diagnose. So the no. most people I hear saying is C, that she did do some sort of planning and she yes. did some sort of implementation. Yeah. Yeah. What is your answer, okay? What's the outcome? So if I wanted to look at the outcome of A, we just did that, right? We looked at the yes. outcome of A. Did she implement? Yes. We can yes. see an implementation, but we don't see an evaluation. No. So look at your outcome. What's the outcome if this is the answer? Does it match really what I'm asking or what I'm being asked? C, yeah. Okay. And you'll do this by practicing. Practicing questions will help you do that. Which activity is the clearest example of the evaluation step in the nursing process? Now, another thing that you can do to help you answer questions is I can say, okay, the evaluation step, it's asking me about steps in the evaluation process. What do I know about the evaluation process? Well, I use that to see if my patients were able to meet their goals and if those goals were effective, right? Yeah. Okay. I also use it to see if my interventions worked. So those yeah. are things that I'm looking at. Was there patient improvement? Was this a valuable step for me? So, you know, brainstorming, was it everything I know about this topic? Because let's say this was hypertension and I couldn't name five or six things about it. How can I answer a question about hypertension if I don't know anything about it? Right. I can't, right? Unless I guess. So would it be There's A? There's no room for guessing in a nursing process. So don't guess, okay? No. Check in the blog post. I would say A is in Alex. This is evaluating. Okay, so you're evaluating the blood pressure two minutes after administering this ACE inhibitor. The length that the blood pressure is Oh, it's D. <laughs> D, recognizing that the blood pressure of 172 over 101 is an abnormal finding? Yes, I think so. Okay, so we have some A's and some D's. Yeah. No choose. Okay. Mm -hmm. How do you evaluate the blood pressure? Well, Ms. Lowe. Yes. My question is like, um, checking the client blood pressure, 30 minutes after the administering this medication, that means you are evaluating yeah, how long the but, of the medication, right? Yeah, because the effect maybe is effective. I don't know, but because if you say you recognize the client blood pressure 175 is abnormal, it should be like under assessment. Mm -hmm. But when you evaluate that is abnormal or normal find that in there's an evaluation. This should be under assessment because you recognize. You already you assess recognize you that it's abnormal. Like to yeah, me, that's why you want to give the medication. Like to that's me, you have for. to do something for the patient and then go back and evaluate what you did. Yeah, that's it. Because you already oh, administered yeah. the medication and you go back after 30 minutes to check the blood pressure. 
So that means you that evaluate, evaluation. If you method. did something for the patient, now you're going to go back and assess if it worked or it didn't work. Right. Yeah. Yes. Anyway. Yes. That's what I'm going with. A. Was it? Yeah. Yeah. Now that makes sense to just like explain mm -hmm. or to all understand it better. Yeah. So you're measuring the blood pressure. You've already done the intervention, such as the drug administration. Now you're going back to see did my client have the desired outcome? Yes. Or doesn't give you the chance. It's not, you're not looking for an outcome here. You're just recognizing. So it's more of a cognitive skill, really, and part of assessment. Okay, good. Oh, Zoom, you're not working now? You quit on us? Thank you. Okay. The client is admitted to the hospital for the treatment of a GI bleed, requires a transfusion of red, of packed red blood cells. Which aspect of the nurse's execution of this order demonstrates technical skill? So we're talking about technical skill, which usually it talks about using the hands-on equipment, being able to do things, right? B. I would say D is in, in dog. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. So let's talk about A, ensuring informed consent has been obtained and properly filed in the client's chart. B, explaining so the technical. process. Okay. B, explain, explaining the process that will be involved in preparing and administering the transfusion. C, understanding the RH system that underlies the client's blood type. And D, starting a new large gauge IV site. So one of these things is not like the other one of these things. <laughs> no. Are you singing? I am singing. Are you I'm singing, singing Sesame Street. Because Sometimes that helps. Sometimes that helps. Sometimes that helps. Sometimes that helps. Questions, I know that when sometimes an answer is different from all the others, sometimes that could be my answer. So when you hear mm -hmm. me singing and you're on the exam, and you hear me singing, one of these things is not <laughs> like the other. Okay, so all of these things kind of talk about your knowledge base, right? Yeah. Two, yeah. I mean, one could kind of be interpersonal also. But three, I mean, four actually talks about physically doing something, right? You're physically using equipment there. That's the only one that you're actually really using equipment in. The rest of them you're not. And it's asking about a technical skill. All right, so performing tasks that require manual dexterity. That's your technical skills. Explaining the transfusion process is largely dependent on interpersonal skills, but then understanding is those cognitive skills. So again, you're using both a little bit of the cognical and some of the other skills as well. But D definitely stood out as being a different type of intervention than the other ones, and I hope that you were able to see that. So some things you'll also see sometimes is you may have opposite. So when you see an answer is completely opposite of another answer, a lot of times it's one of those answers. Okay, in which situation would the nurse be most justified in implementing trial and error problem solving? So which one would be okay for you to use trial and error with? And so now, you know, you're kind of thinking about patient safety also.
Maybe B? C? C. Okay, B might be an option because you may have to use different forms of medication to a patient in pain. Of course, we would do it one at a time and in a safe manner, but it, it's a possibility. I would say okay. D is in dog. I'm thinking a bunch of D's today. <laughs> okay, the nurse is attempting to determine the range of motion of a client's hip joint following surgery. What about A? Anybody have thoughts on A? Mm -hmm. Would it matter that your client's obese? Would their apical pole still be in the same spot? Yeah, they'll just have to push in more to get it. It's hard to obtain. But that's not an answer. And what about C? Somebody that's post stroke, would you want to try? Yes, I think about C. But then wouldn't they have to go to like a nurse for uh for thousands? Like we're not just or would you want to do an evaluation on them because if you do trial and error and they aspirate, then what? Yeah, then that's a mm -hmm. fault. That's what I'm thinking when I look at the question. Like I'm looking at what can we possibly trial and error without really harming the patient? And the only one that I can I personally can see is B. Yeah, oh, because I would think A would be the only one that wouldn't harm the patient. <laughs> No, because B is just PR. Mm. It's just a PRN medication, so would no. it matter? No, me, me, meaning like at least you know it's a PRN and probably just assessing the person for the pain and then you get, mm, never mind. I should go around. You're right. No, no, you're breaking it down. Breaking I was going to say, let's down because you have to. Like, I'm not 100 on every question that comes across here, okay? Yeah, but, but I like, don't want to be because I want you to understand that there's sometimes that we're not going to know or we're going to make mistakes. So if that's the case, how do we get to that best answer? When I don't know the answer, how do I get to that best answer? Yeah, to the elimination, the process of elimination. So for B, since it has like a PRN, and you know probably you already gave that standard pain medication for you to obviously try and every give that pain, you see if it worked or not. Is that correct? That's kind of like why I'm veered towards B. You could possibly have to try different medications for this patient in pain because pain medication doesn't work the same for everybody. Yeah. Oh, I think it's a reasonable choice. Yeah, because D's too much. You, you really can't do the range of motion unless they probably went to PT. I still a. say A was a. the safest. <laughs> oh, my oh a. a. That's like so easy, though. I would have never thought that. A. I was about to say, yeah. You and Ms. Loach was low key trying to tell us, too, about that. <laughs> I know. We still trying to like name the test. That's okay, because, you know, it's better to be wrong now. Yeah. Right? So you always want to think about the safety of your client. So, again, trial and error can be dangerous to the client. So if you're doing the um, range of motion, you could dislocate the limb somehow. If you're doing um, administration with medication, you could under-medicate, over-medicate, or, you know, harm the patient some other way. Um, they did with this with my father. They trialed and erred with a chemo med. However, the process of that trial and error, they forgot to check lab values. And so he ended up in hepatitis induced um, drug medication problem. And he almost died from it. So, you know, you have to be careful when you're trying out medications that you're following all the guidelines, using all the safety things. Same thing with the swallowing thing. It could result in aspiration. Yeah. So, you know, the worst thing, if you didn't find the anatomical mark, would be what? You would mark it again and try to find it, right? Yeah. Right. So, again, if you think about the outcome, right? If we thought about the outcomes there, then maybe you could have narrowed that down to that answer. Because if I didn't find the landmark, what would be my outcome? I might not know their apical pulse, and I would have to keep looking. I might be able to get a Doppler or something or another more seasoned nurse to help me, right? Yeah. yeah. Right. One with two, I'm either not going to treat the pain or I'm over going to medicate the pa over medicate the patient. So really what would we do if we were trying to determine what's best as far as a PRN medication for a client? We would yeah. want to know what they've taken before that's been effective, right? 
Right. As opposed to trial and error, because that was our trial and error. If they took it before and it was effective, then we know we can give it again because it's probably going to work. But if they took it before and it wasn't affected or they had some sort of reaction to it, then we already know, let's not give this. Yeah. Okay. All right, which statement best conveys the role of intuition in a nurse's problem solving? Remember, we talked about intuition. What is this based on? Like what they feel inside. So you understand I would say the situation. See, you have this experience. Yeah, you have you. this knowledge. You have this background. So sometimes you read a question in nursing, right? And right away, your brain goes to an answer. And it goes there because you have this intuition or this gut feeling, right? Right. So C. C is a cat. Okay, so let's read them all. In, in experienced nurses, intuition can be a valid replacement for scientific problem solving. Yeah. Would you say that's true or false? False. Okay, I probably would always take scientific methods over intuition because sometimes our intuition can be wrong. Intuition is reliable when those nurses implementing it have a special gift. Well, if you're a nurse, you made it through nursing school, and you're here to tell about it, you probably already have a special gift. But it didn't come okay. from intuition. Right. But intuition may be part of that special gift, but not the whole thing, I don't think. Mm. And then, <laughs> um, it can clinically be useful, yes. As an adjunct, yes. I agree with that. And then two, it's unreliable. That should be avoided. I disagree with that because as a critical care nurse, sometimes my intuition is what gets me through the day. I really see a problem coming before it gets here. And there's interventions I can take to stop that problem from coming. Sometimes as nurses, we see the problem coming and we ignore it. We're like, yeah, I know, but I'm gonna just ignore that today. Like I really didn't see it. And then, 15 minutes later, we're like, why did I do that? Why did I ignore that? I knew I saw it coming, and I just didn't pay attention, right? Do you ever do that? Hello? Am yes. I preaching by myself today? No, we're here. Okay. Yes. <laughs> we're muted, so we don't think. I apologize, but you know, if I get on a pulpit and stay there too long, you let me know, because I'll get on them sometime. <laughs> Yes, so when you sit down to the exam, and you start taking these questions, you hear me in your head. Hey, yes. Miss Sue said this, Miss Sue said that, and hopefully it helps guide you towards the way you need to be rolling. Okay, so blended competencies, clinical reasoning. What is a characteristic of person-centered care? So can it be used in all hospital settings? Yes. It should be. It should be used everywhere in every setting. Is it independent of other disciplines? I think it's probably C. It involves general care for all the clients. Okay. Or is it a framework for providing care? Right. I think it's D. I think it's D. I think it's D. I think it's D. Mm. Okay, we got a lot of D's, so let's see. Let's see. All right, so it's a framework for providing care because it's not independent of other disciplines. It's actually interdependent. Um, we use it within all those disciplines and it can be used in all settings. It's not just limited to the hospital. Also, um, it aims to provide specific care to people based on an individual need, need not on uh, general care. So when we make it person-centered care, what we understand is 
some of the things we were talking about earlier in the care plan. I understand that not all patients are going to adhere to that cardiac diet. I understand that all patients are not going to stop smoking. So the plan of care I developed for them, if my patient isn't going to stop smoking, I may put smoking cessation in my plan of care, but ideally, I know that my patient isn't going to meet those goals if they're not interested in stopping smoking. It's not going to happen because they have to be interested in being compliant with that care plan. They have to say, this is for me. This is how I want things to go. When the nurse is administering furosemide, 20 milligrams to a client in congestive heart failure, what phase of the nursing process does this represent? D. D. Implementation. D. Okay. Yeah. Good. All right, you got the drugs, you're giving it, all right? Then you're gonna what? Evaluate to make sure that it comes out the way that you want it to come out, right? So how would we evaluate? What types of evaluation would we do for this patient? Measure output. Check. Okay, measure their yeah. volume of output, and we might actually do their input also so we can compare and look for a negative or positive balance, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. What else would we do to measure this? Blood pressure? Blood pressure, yeah. Okay, blood pressure could measure if our volume is going down sometimes because we know our pressure is probably going to be a little bit more if we are in volume overload. What else? How about, how about fluid restriction? So fluid restriction wouldn't help us measure this. Oh, measuring, okay. Yeah. But weight gain or weight loss, so weighing the patient would help us measure this. Um, also, we would want to look at their specific gravity. That okay. might tell us something of the urine, right? Um, and also, because, you know, specific gravity measures what? How diluted, uh, or concentrated our yeah. urine is, right? So if our urine's right. becoming more concentrated, what does that mean? We're bringing fluid off, right? And maybe too right. much. And maybe too much. So we have to watch that to make sure we don't dehydrate the patient. And that's what I said. If the patient was on a fluid restriction and we were giving furosemide, we have to monitor to make sure that doesn't happen. So those are a couple of things that we could do to try to help us monitor that. Because if someone is on furosemide long term, they could become dehydrated. Yeah. The nurse administers pain medication to a post op client. The nursing fit process that is occurring is B. 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 implementation. Okay, good. All right, let's try some of these from number 14. Hopefully we can get through most of the questions in 14 to 15. And then if we get done through all those, we'll come back to 13. Ms. Lewis, did that thing tell all about uh, the 14th all about assessment? I'm sorry? This 14 is assessment. Is assessment 14? Yeah.
Okay, so at the end of the shift, the nurse documents the client voided 475 mLs through a indwelling urinary catheter. What type of data has the nurse documented? Objective. Objective. So, Michael, were you saying that because you feel like you guys don't need help in this area? No, we need help everywhere. Yeah, yeah absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> we need help everywhere. Yeah. All right, so we're going to perform an effusion. Yeah, All right, so while performing an assessment, the nurse recognizes that his own Personal biases may interfere with the collection of data. What steps should the nurse take to assure that information is factual and accurate? So one, the nurse should document on the client's chart that the assessment data may be biased. Would you do that? No. Okay. The nurse should inform the client of the potential biases and obtain the client's opinion. No. no. The nurse should verify the information with one or two family members without informing the client. No. 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 So again, like, you know, think about things that make sense versus what doesn't make sense. Because Judge Judy says if it doesn't make sense, it's not true. And I like her. If this nurse should consult with another nurse for that colleague's description of the assessment or observation. Yes. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. All right, so good. You're going with another person who hopefully is an expert and they'll be able to tell you, you know, if you if the, if the information is valid or if it sounds valid. It's always good to consort with someone else. That's why you got to be smarter than the average bear, because if someone comes to ask for your opinion, you want to be able to give them a valid opinion. Otherwise, they'll never ask you. The nurse is interviewing a client and is focusing on avoiding comments and questions that will impede communication. So when you're thinking about things that impede communication, you're always thinking about like the way you sound, the way you're um, the way you present yourself, do you look approachable? Do you sound approachable? When you talk to me, are you lecturing me or are you giving me valid information in a way that's non-judgmental? So which sentence demonstrates the appropriate use of communication techniques? Y'all think it's C? Uh, a is too like, oh, why do you feel that way about your kids? So, like you're you're like kind of judging and like why? Like why do you feel that way? Have you ever know? Have you ever heard that the no pain no gain? It's more like gym stuff. It says which demonstrates the appropriate use of communication techniques. Yeah, because you're like ask. How about C is in cat? Thing them for them to give you an open ended question. Isn't that like the way this? Yeah, that's what I said first. What she said about her outside. Uh, which because one were you saying? Like, you think is right? C is in cat because A is being too judgmental. And then D is like, just when you first notice, it's not. Or how about, you see D? D is sort of open-ended too. Yeah, so it's like. I, I would go with D. D is in dog, right? Yeah. Yeah. It looks, do you have any, yeah, because both of them are sort of open-ended, right? C and D is in dog, but D sounds more, you know. Specific to like where what they ask asking. when we come in, yeah. What they actually ask you. Michael, why aren't you talking? Well, if you ask, if you ask, do you have any I additional call. questions for me? The person can just say no, and the conversation is over. But if you ask, right, like, if it's sure. different, yeah, like, then it can continue. So that's why I chose D. Okay, you I like it. that breakdown. I like yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think it's D too. I know that. <laughs> But what's this for just for us to, we don't have to do this, right? After the points, we don't have to do this. She's just doing this for review, right? Yeah. Okay, because I'm about to say, we didn't, she never, the our class didn't show us to do this. Which is good because she- Because, um, but you want to say something, right? Go ahead, Michael. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Too much flirtation, do that after. What y'all say? <laughs> yeah, I, uh, Wendy, you first notice the rash on your leg? 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's what we said was the last. Yeah, that's a real open question because you want the patient to verbalize or get more information from patient. But if you say, do you have any additional question for me? No. Yeah, this yeah, is when the conversation is over, you know, what else can you build on? I, I can the- rephrase that, like being like, is there anything I can do for you? Then yeah, for that's, not, that's not what is there. I can still be like, no. Yeah. <laughs> like, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't, it depends on the person or how they are, if they feel you like your vibe at that moment. So, yeah, so D is just basically answer the question. And like, then, you never ask the patient why. Oh, you can't so uh, that out. Yeah, because it's judgmental. And have you ever heard no. the no pain, no gain? That's just like the what right. are you asking me? <laughs> We're not in uh LA fitness. <laughs> <laughs> I don't is it LA or um, what is that, that planet, planet fitness? fitness. Yeah, planet Future fitness. fitness. <laughs> <laughs> How are we doing, guys? Sorry about the interruption. It's not a pretty sight. I've been looking for my cat for two days. So, oh wow, yeah, I have one. So let's um, get back to the questions, and then when we're done with these couple of questions, we'll go back and look at the math if someone has a question. All right, the nurse is interviewing a client and focusing on avoiding comments and questions that will impede communication. So, which demonstrates the appropriate use of communication techniques? What did you guys decide? With, with my group of nurses colleagues in the house, we chose D. You chose D. When did you first notice the rash <laughs> on your leg? Yes, with my colleagues. Not Are me, you right? with my colleagues. Are you right? All right. We got it right. <laughs> 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 so leave the why's out, okay? Because why puts the patient in a defensive mode, so we don't use why. Period. Uh, All right, that's one of the words that we never use. And when you see statements in questions that say never, always, you stay away from those answers. But in this case, for why, we never use it because it does put our patient on the defense. All right. During the initial assessment of a newly admitted client, the nurses clustered the client's range of motion with his gait, bowel sounds, and usual <laughs> elimination pattern, and his chest sounds with his respiratory rate. Nurses most likely organizing assessment data according to what? A, body system. Anybody else? B. Human needs. Okay, so tell me your rationale for body systems. Thing that has to do with. Sorry, I was muted. Um, because it, we're pretty much going through all the pa- uh, you know, all the vitals and respiratory, which is a part of the body systems. Like we're we're examining and reviewing the different areas to find out our assessment. I mean, through our assessment. Okay, so you're looking at the respiratory system all together. You're listening to the sounds, the rate, the depth, the how many per minute, all that good stuff. When you're looking at the um, bowel sounds, you're looking at the elimination pattern, the bowels, how often does he move them, his range of motion. Why would you care about, I mean, um, <laughs> his range of motion and his gait for something else, I'm sorry. But you're putting all the things that go together together, right? We're not right. talking about human needs because human needs would be things like what? Like, like shelter, food. Safety, physiologic, those kind of things, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. We're not talking about response pattern either, right? Because we're not talking about how our patient responds to this process. We're just talking about clustering these things together so that we can get an overall picture because Let's say that I think that something's going on with my client's respiratory system. Just counting the rates is going to give me what? Nothing, right? It's just going to tell right, me what the right. rate is. But I need to know these other things in order to come up with some sort of logical or reasonable deduction as to what I'm going to do. So I need the whole picture. And this right. is what sometimes nurses don't give you is the whole picture. They give you a lousy picture in report, a lousy picture in a note, 
I need to see the whole picture so I know which way to go, right? Yes. Okay, so it's a um, way of, it's a model or a way of organizing data using those body systems, which is why we use that head to toe method. We can keep those systems organized when we do that. All right, the nurse is assessing a male client with the diagnosis of vascular dementia. As a result of his cognitive deficit, the client is unable to provide many of the data required on the hospital nursing assessment or admission history document. How would the nurse best proceed with this assessment? So your client is not able to tell you information. How are you going to gather that information and make sure that it's valid? Yeah, you can you can contact the family of, of friends. You think the family's gonna give you the most valid information? Yeah, because the and the client is is uh, one client mm -hmm. is dementia, and that's the only people that you can get information from. The family yeah, you can't get it from a family because it's not that's not accurate. It's like you gotta wait for the patient. So probably a because they'll probably remember if they have the dementia. At least they'll remember shortly, and you just go back and forth to get more information for what you need. You can't get it from like a family. How about D is and David or no D other because the yeah, question because said the, the information admitted in the records from other institutions was most likely entered by who? Yeah, because the question said data required on the hospital admission history. So family member can give more information about the client. Okay. Yeah, so, that's, what I'm I'm saying. that's what I'm saying. Right. But if, if there's any option, I don't know. Because I, I don't feel like that's family. Family people should get more information about client than any other. Because the rest of it is like objective data. So our yeah, question is really asking how we should best proceed with the assessment. Oh. That's why I said A, because you have to talk to them shortly so they can understand. A, yeah. That's why I was saying A. I said. A, yep. B. Yeah, I said it. <laughs> yeah, so because my right, right, yeah, right, 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 information. Right, if you need information, the clients are unable to provide information, and the only and people can get information from is from the family. You're getting there fast. The, the, the rest of it is like objective data, what you can get on, um, and from the client. So I actually did that on purpose, okay? Because mm -hmm. I just want you to understand what you're reading when you're reading it. And don't read into how the question is being proposed. Okay, because when you what you did is, you, I said, how should the nurse best proceed with this assessment? So you picked the one that had assessment listed in it. And sometimes the tricks will, the questions will trick you up like that. But you really want to go back to what is the question really asking me? So cognitively, my patient is being admitted right at this moment, okay? I might not have access to the other records right now. I will eventually look up at those. But we still want to use our family that's present because they might be able to give us little hints and clues right now about what happened with the patient. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. After conducting the initial assessment of a new resident of long-term care facility, the nurse is preparing to terminate the interview. Which question is the most appropriate conclusion to the interview? So if you look at B, I mean, if I look at the answers, to me, B says one of these things is not like the other. 
Um, it also is asking the patient if they've forgotten anything that we maybe might need to know that maybe they didn't think was important. I think in the end, we're gonna end up giving them a survey and they're gonna tell us at that point what their expectations were. Um, although we might wanna know that somewhat going into it, but it may not reflect if we're person-centered care, how we're gonna care for the patient. And this is um, part of the terminal phase, okay? So the reason why um, the expectations and previous practices wouldn't be included in this is because they are actually part of the working phase. That's another rationale why it's not part of this answer, okay? We do like to ask a lot of questions about the interview phases, so I would definitely know the initial phase, the working phase, the termination phase, you wanna know about those. NCLEX loves to test on those also. How should a nurse best document the assessment findings that have caused her to suspect a client is depressed following his below the knee amputation? A. 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 Okay, A says specifically what the client says. B says specifically what the client says. C is the nurse's interpretation, right? And she's not really specific in what the signs and symptoms are. D um, says the clients make statements indicating the loss of hope, but she doesn't say what those statements are. Well, I would um, say D is in dog. I don't know. But um, B doesn't state what the clients say because, because um, the quote, it just say client state. And after the client state, the that's what we're looking after from the quotation. Okay. I'm sticking Michael's with looking, it. Michael's looking hard at these answers. You see that? <laughs> he is. He's, he's picking he's, out he's little details. Okay. And that's why he's as successful he, as he is with answering the questions. It's, he's looking for these little details, these little clues in the question and in the statement answer. I'm going with whatever Michael say. Go ahead, Michael. No, 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 I'm out. <laughs> what you want to look at is what's the differences in the statement. So A actually says what the client is saying, right? Right. Everything else was a paraphrase or a quotation, and that's why A was more important. So what I want you to get from Michael is not picking every answer he picks, but I want you to learn how to do this little trick that he's pretty successful at doing which is he's able to see different clues in the answer and in the question. And that's what I'm also trying to help you to do. Not to give you the answer to the question, but to help you differentiate what the question is actually asking you and what the act, uh, statement, the answer is actually saying. So you don't select wrong answers or that you don't hear something different in the question than what it's actually asking you. There's a flip to that, carrying you to the question. Practice, practice will make you better at this. Every time you answer the question, practice breaking it down. And if you use those Kaplan posters, po I did send you guys the Kaplan posters, right? Yes or no? I thought I did. If I didn't, let me know and I'll send them again. Mm -hmm.
So let me just read the posters and you can tell me if you remember seeing them or not. I don't think we're going to get to questions 15 today. Um, but you guys have access to those questions. Is there anybody that doesn't know how to get to these questions? Um, is it under our, our canvas? Uh, it's under um, your book. It's not under canvas, these questions. Oh, under our book, okay. Yeah, it's under your, um, the, you have to use that scratch off code in the actual book to download the book. And oh, yeah, yeah, student, I did that. Yeah, then it's under student resources. So then you go to okay. student resources, see student resources, it'll look like this book. Can you see my screen? No. It'll look like this book under student resources. Okay, yeah. Okay, so did I give you guys these? Can you see my screen? Yes. Do you guys know if I gave you these or not? I believe. I believe. Yes, I no. know. Okay. okay. Yeah, I think you did. You did email those to us. So okay. you look yeah, at, yes. Like, yeah. Just, Thank you. just think about these things like when you're practicing questions. Do I know what they're asking me? Do I need to do an assessment? Do I need to do implementation? And how do you determine that? Well, did they give me enough information? Did they give me enough data in the question? So use these when you're answering questions, even if you can only use a couple of them right now, because right now, a lot of your questions are going to be content-based. All right? So the first thing you want to know is, can I identify what this question is actually asking me? Because you can't answer it if you can't. And the other thing you want to look at is what's going to be the outcome if I pick this answer choice. But in other words, if I went into the room and my patient was restless and I don't know, somebody's on, um, got their volume up. Let's say I went into the room and the, the question's asking me um, about my patient. I came into the room and they're restless and they're moving around and I took the blood pressure and it's 90 over 50 and the heart rate's 112. So my answer choices are recheck the patient in 15 minutes, notify the physician, um, do an EKG, Okay, or um, start a blood transfusion. What's your answer going to be? It's not going to be recheck the blood pressure in 15 minutes, right? Because you don't need more data. If your patient, if you know that the blood pressure was off and your patient's restless and their heart rate is increased, you know that what's probably going on. They're probably either bleeding or they're losing fluid some way, they might be going into shock, okay? And the first sign of that is that restlessness, that hypoxia. They're not getting that good blood perfusion. Then you've got a drop in the blood pressure and an increase in a heart rate. So why would you wanna take another blood pressure? You don't need more blood pressures. You already know what the blood pressure is, right? So that's not something you're gonna do. So again, you're thinking about the outcome. If I waste time, my patient is bleeding and I waste time by taking another blood pressure, how long does it take for someone to bleed out? Not long, a few minutes, right? So you guys are on mute. I know you're on mute because I heard somebody in the background. But if you're answering me, I can't hear you. So, uh, you know, I want you to understand what's going to be my outcome if I pick this client. So when you think about your questions, Think about you just walked into the room. Here's my patient in the bed. I've got one choice I can make here. What's going to be the safest choice for this patient? Because once I make that choice, I'm walking back out of the room. There's nothing else I can do at the moment. Now, out of those answer choices that we give you in the question, all four of them might be right. 
but which one is most right right now? So what's most right right now? And when I do that, what's going to happen when I leave the room? You want to think about this every time you read a question. What's the topic? What's my outcome going to be? How's this going to affect the patient? And that's going to help you answer questions a little bit easier. All right, so think about using those posters. Remember, this is one thing I always try to um, really um, be into your brains is, you know how sometimes you're going to the grocery store and on your way to the store, um, between where the store is and where you live is some place that you frequent, like work. So you're going to the grocery store and you catch yourself as you go past your job Turn it into it. And you say to yourself, hey, dumbass, I'm not working today. Go to the grocery store. But because you have this habit <laughs> of turning into the grocery store all the time, your body takes you there. Okay? Yeah. So it's something I preach to nurses at all, all the time. Because, you know, my thing is when Department of Health comes, if you do what you're supposed to do every day, you don't have to worry that they're coming, right? Because you're in a natural habit of doing things a certain way. And so your body is going to follow those habits because you've built those good habits. But if you've built bad habits, your body is going to follow those bad habits. So teach yourself good habits to study. Good habits of how to answer these questions. Because those good habits will follow you into the exam. And so when you're taking the exam, you won't have as much anxiety because you've instilled these good habits. And whether you want it to happen to you or not, it's going to happen naturally because you've practiced it. You've worked on it. And that's how you get it. And it's the same thing. You know, you do something over and over and over. It's going to naturally happen for you after a while. It takes a little time to build it but it will build for you. It won't take you as long to build that skill as you think because you've already got those PN skills and some of you may already be functioning in that RN role at your jobs because you're the one in charge. You're the one on the floor. So everybody's coming to you when the big dog ain't there to get the decisions. So you just have to think, so manage that way of thinking a little bit different now. I'm here on my own. I can make some independent decisions, and I'm within my scope of practice to do it. But I want to make sure that I'm making good, methodical, well-thought-out decisions. And how do I know if I'm doing that? Evaluate what my outcome's going to be. And you can do that on questions. You can evaluate what your outcome's going to be if I choose this answer. In the beginning, it's going to take you time to do that. But as you keep doing questions, it's going to start to happen naturally and much quicker. Okay. So before I close out, um, math. Who has math questions? I do. Okay. Oh, thank God. I thought I was on mute. Woo. Okay. So, um, oh, well, one question really quick, if you don't mind, because I saw our group is asking. The care plan, for some reason, we're having trouble just typing in it. Are we supposed to be printing this out, writing on it, and then scanning it and sending it to you? Because it, it won't let us edit it to put the information in the care plan document. Okay. Do you have the templates that I sent you? Yes. Okay. One is a Word doc, so you can type in there, and you can save it on your computer. Okay. This one here is the PDF. You should be able to type in there. Should be I should to be able to type in the box and type in there. Okay. All right. I'm going to go. When you start typing, it may look like, um, like, like she can't see it. Like you can't see it, but it, she can see it. I know mine was vis visible, even though it didn't look like it was. Once you send it over to me, I can actually click in the box and stuff populates. If it doesn't, I'll let you know, but usually it does. Okay, great. All right, thank but you. If you're not, if for some reason the PDF isn't working, that's why I sent you the Word doc. Okay.